Gracious God, we have seen your miracles this week. Miracles of the everyday. Bright sunshine and gentle rains. Your creation is beautiful in its complexity and yet its simplicity. Thank you for the reminders, the experiences of your presence. But God, this morning we ask for your patience with us too. Patience in the times our frustrations and worries overcome us and distract us from your presence in our lives. A presence that would make so small our daily frustrations. Mold us into present people. People anticipating yet patient to see you in your evolving creation. Help us to grow in trust of your creative process in our lives, in the lives all around us. May the sounds of children call us to witness your presence. May the celebrations of life and earth in our lives make us ever aware of your creative process. May we put our trust in you, that you are making us into disciples of compassion. May we trust that you are with us even when it feels you can't be. May we listen to our neighbors and understand how they are experiencing your presence. And God, may old words and experiences have new life to us. It is in that that we remember Jesus' words, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The children are now invited to come forward. Tristan, hey, we don't know the way. We're going to Squash. 
could turn into a squash. That would be great. Do you like squash, Colin? No. Do you want to sit down? Yeah, okay. I think I have a seat. So, the Word of God, where, how do we get the Word of God? Where does it come from? The Bible. So Jesus is talking about taking the Word of God and planting it in us, in our hearts, and then we grow and we can spread, just like the basil bushes will grow and spread if you take good care of it. If you take good care of the Word of God in your heart, you can spread the Word and share it with other people. And sometimes you can hear the same story when you're five, and when you're ten, and when you're really old. <laughs> then <it's... laughs> How old are you? I'm seven. You're seven now, see? And, and the stories change every year. You went to two sizes. Oh, and so now the story really means something different to you, and you keep coming to church to keep learning about the seeds of God, and so you can grow in your faith. And you can grow in your faith. Yeah, and it's always going to be the faith about Jesus and the stories about Jesus, because that's the seeds that we're planting. So I have a silly something else to show you. Are you ready? Calvin, you want to see something different? I made a toy. I made my own toy. I'll turn around in a minute. We'll do it twice. So you've got a seed, this great big giant seed. And it's going to grow. Oh, it's going to grow a little more. And a little more. So then you have a little flower, and it can be a little puppet flower. You just so you could, a flower. You could do it again.
So let me just recognize this. May have had one. And it fits nicely into the scripture today about the mustard seed. Yeah. Yeah. This is a mustard seed bracelet. How many of you guys have one or had one? This hand has So I received this from my dear aunt. And growing up, I would play for jewelry, and I always admired it. And it wasn't until I got older that I understand the importance of it and the significance of it. And now I hold it in my little box with my jewelry. I don't wear it because I don't want it to break. But it's one of my favorite parables now. So, as we are preparing for this week, we have a lot of opportunity ahead of us. And like with the mustard seed, which is the smallest seed, as we know from reading, and grows into a bush that has branches that are strong to give life to a sanctuary for birds, which as you know, I love birds. Um, but aside from that, um, it's a significant parable for me because it just kind of speaks to how we are. Not necessarily as a person, but as an individual in a church, which is a family, and how it just takes that little seed to be planted and some love and care, and then it grows, and then the gifts and opportunities that come from that are immeasurable. So would you please pray with me? Loving Creator, as we listen to the stories of your parables, help us to find meaning and understanding in them. Let us reach down and see how those can translate into our daily lives. Let us become the sower so that we can sow the seeds of your love and not hide it in our bushel, but share it with everyone that we know and love. In your loving name, Amen. Let us graciously receive our time and offer.
In this episode of Mark 4, 1-34, we hear that Jesus began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around Him that He got into a boat on the sea and sat there, while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables. And in His teaching, He said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, Let anyone with ears to hear listen. When he was alone, those who were around him, along with the twelve, asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look, but not perceive, and may indeed listen, but not understand so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy. But they have no root and endure only for a while. Then, when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it yields nothing. And these are the ones sown on the good soil. They hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. He said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under the bushel basket or under the bed and not on the lampstand? For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given you. For to those who have, more will be given. And from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. He also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground, and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, 
is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. Amen. Thank you, Lisa and Keith, for enduring that long reading with us. And thank you, Fire and Lacey and Allie, for that beautiful anthem to us. Let us pray. God's may, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of the hearts of all those in this place, may they be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Many of you know that my day job is in data. I work over at UCO in institutional assessment, doing really nerdy things with data and statistics that would bore, well, some days it bores me too. <laughs> but one of our main tasks is sifting through all the data that's generated to identify meaningful trends impacting students, particularly those things that impact a student's ability to get their degree. So I've always had an interest in data. And so as we started our journey after Epiphany and are exploring the question, why church, I couldn't help but search for data. <clears throat> and this morning I'd like to, if you'll let me, nerd out a little with you. And we're going to take a look at some data. Many of you know that the Pew Research Center released their latest statistics in October on religion and public life from their religious landscape and their aggregated political surveys. And now I know you all have read those reports and the wonderful charts, so this might be a little boring for you, but, well, that's what I can tell myself if I look out and you're a little bored. But Chuck's going to show us a few highlights from the latest round. Now, this is a little hard to see, I get that, um, but we're just noticing general trends, and I'll fill you in on the rest. So, as I'm sure you all know, the percentage of adults in the United States who identify as Christian continues to decline. So, shown on this chart, it's that dark blue line at the top. That's the percentage of you as adults claiming Christian identity. In 2009, 77% claimed this identity, and as of last year, 65% do. For Protestant Christians, which is where we fall, that's that second line. Actually, if you'll go back, Chuck, and go through that one more. The second line, the light blue one, is Protestant Christians. And it's not as uh, steep a decline as overall Christianity, but down 8% over the last decade. The gray line at the bottom of this chart is all other faiths, so Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, all grouped into one. They have slightly increased, about a percent over the same time, but nothing dramatic. And then in the middle is where the most change has happened, uh, besides that with Christianity. Among unaffiliated adults, that dark green line has gone from 17% in 2009 to more than a quarter of U.S. adults in 2019. And within this group, that light green line, uh, that light green line is not agnostic or atheist, uh, which counts as the unaffiliated, but a group that says they believe nothing in particular. They have increased to now 17% of the U.S. population. You've probably heard, heard them referred to before as nuns. That's N-O-N-S-E-S. Okay, Chuck, now the next slide. And if we look at this same data generationally, here's what it looks like. The only group over the past decade that has shown a bit of growth is the silent generation. That top blue line. 62% of those born between 1928 and 1945 identify as Protestant Christian. All other generations have declined in this identification. Boomers are down about 4%. Gen Xers are down about 5 
and my fellow pesky millennials, only about a third of us now identify as Protestant Christians, down about 6% over the last decade. So each successive generation is claiming less and less a Protestant Christian identity. Okay, Jeff. One last bit of information for you. As you might expect, given the declines in Christian identity, religious service attendance has also taken a hit. On these crossing lines, that shows us that sometime between 2014 and 15, more adults started attending services a few times a year or less compared to a few times a month. So right now, only 45%, that dark blue line, only 45% of U.S. adults attend service at least once a month. Okay, so all those parts aside, I am sure you all have noticed a decline in Christianity over the last decade, right? Fittingly, from all that data, Pew's headline for their latest publication was, In U.S., Decline of Christianity Continues at Rapid Pace. So as we ponder the question, why church? We must start with the reality that we are asking a question that more often than not can't even be answered by the majority of U.S. adults because they've already said no to church. So to us and to our scriptures today, why church? In our gospel reading from Mark, we get not just one parable today, but four, plus two teachings on parables. Lucky us. The first we heard was the parable of the sower. Jesus tells about a sower scattering seeds. The seed fell among four terrains, bare path where birds quickly ate it, rocky ground with little soil and room for roots, thorns where over time the seed was choked out, and lastly the good soil where it grew into a bountiful harvest. Then Jesus explains the purpose of parables to a smaller group. He explains that hearing the parables is being given the key to, not the kingdom itself, but to the mystery or the secret of the kingdom. Those who have heard God speak will understand parables, but they will be riddles to everyone else. And as Mark reports, the previous parable of the sower is about seed being God's word, and the types of soil are supposedly us, and our ability to hear the word. Then Jesus tells the parable of the lamp under a bushel basket. Like the other Gospels, and in life in general, light is for the purpose of seeing. Jesus instructs his followers to pay attention, and to not hide what they have seen. Then there are two more parables, which often get smushed into one big one. The parable of the growing seed and the mustard shrub. Referring back to a sower again, Jesus tells about seeds scattered. With no intervention from the sower, the seed does what it does in its own time. First sprouting, and then becoming full grown, ready for harvest. And when asked what the kingdom could be compared to, Jesus tells about not a cedar tree as described in the Hebrew scriptures, but a mustard shrub. From a very tiny seed grows a plant large enough for birds to take shelter. So why church? I'm sure you have heard this collection of parables interpreted to tell us that church is where we gain instruction to become good soil. The birds and thorns in the first parable represent the world and Satan's work to plunder the word of God, making it so difficult for seeds in the church to grow. But if we, the church, persevere and teach about heaven and salvation from the tiniest of our efforts will come the biggest of results, so big that all nations of heaven and earth will find shelter in our comfort and in our teachings. The church is the beacon of hope with the teachings on how to live and with the secret ticket to heaven and salvation, the place of the good soil. Thank goodness we are not the bad soil. The kingdom is growing and the church is growing. Uh-oh. Has anyone heard anything similar to that interpretation before? Now, I don't want to say, well, I do want to say a little bit, but I don't want to say that that interpretation is wrong. Because here's the thing about parables. You can never fully get them wrong. But you can also never fully get them right. 
But the motif of earnest teaching by the church, the idea that we come once a week to get our knowledge from the sole source of knowledge and pay towards our ticket to some far off heaven, is for me at least a little bit bland. Because you want to feel that way too. And this interpretation is a little off because it doesn't jive with the data. And the reasons why the nuns, the NONESs, are leaving the church. Because when they're asked to follow up, what they're telling us, and what they're telling us, the church, not just the, the scientists, is that they don't have a problem with our God necessarily, or even our Jesus, because the data still shows belief in God at over 80%. But they're telling us that our narrow teachings about God and Jesus and how those teachings make us behave don't align with their experiences of the divine. This parable can't, and it does not need to tell us or anyone the answers to why God. It needs to tell us something different, especially if we're to even begin to answer the question, why church? We need something else, a little bit more. My New Testament professor, Amy Jo Levine, or as we call her AJ, used to say a parable, parables should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. So what can we get a little uncomfortable with this morning? Now, there were some other statistics in the Pew data that caught my attention this week. Amongst the decline in Christianity, there were increases in some surprising things. Chuck, if you'll help us out again. Since 2007, over the same periods of Christian decline, more U.S. adults have reported feeling spiritual peace and well-being. And the largest generational gains were among those pesky 18 to 29-year-olds. And similarly, uh, next slide, please. There's been an increase in people feeling wonder about the universe and very dramatically among 18 to 29 year olds they're that shooting yellow line so while church attendance has declined what we might consider spiritual practices have increased shortly after this data came through in the last major landscape study in 2014 it was noted that a quarter of american american adults participate in prayer groups scripture study or other religious education at least weekly and that had increased since 2007 Similarly, weekly meditation has increased, particularly among the nuns, and more than three-quarters of Americans reported a strong sense of gratitude, with Christians reporting most strongly. And in the last bit I want to show you this morning, from a 2017 study from Pew, is data about where U.S. adults are finding meaning in their lives. The top response was in spending time with family, with 69% of people reporting they find meaning there. And actually, overall, 40% of adults said they find the most meaning of their lives in spending time with family. This was followed by being outdoors, spending time with friends, I missed the D there, sorry, caring for pets, listening to music, reading, and you'll notice that religious faith barely beats out job or career for last place. So that's all the data I have for you this morning. Thanks for hanging in there. So in our data points to people saying no to church, at the same time people are saying yes to spiritual experience, and even the experience of a higher power. And more than anything, the data is telling us about a shift that can perhaps help us shift in our parables this morning to create some meaning for ourselves and to maybe answer the question, why church? And that shift is one of spiritual experience. What if instead of this collection of parables telling us about when the kingdom will arrive and who will be able to understand the kingdom, what if it's telling us where the kingdom is, where God is? Listen, Jesus begins. A sower went to sow. He scattered seed. But on fertile soil, the seed grew. But this wasn't immediate. It took time. Time for seeds to do what seeds do. Time for soil to do what soil does. Time for birds to do what birds do. 
But slowly, the seed grew into a plant you wouldn't expect from the proportion of its seed size. And not only did that plant produce shade for creatures, but it could be used in bounties for spices and medicine. Maybe this parable is plain as day or plain as nature, not an elaborate allegory about Christian empire growth. The original hearers would have been surprised to have the kingdom referenced as a mustard shrub rather than a mighty cedar foretold in the Hebrew scriptures. But mustard with its multiple uses was not a bad alternative to get them reimagining the kingdom, to get them listening. But most importantly, Jesus is throwing off here expectation. And that is what the parables should do most. In escaping convention, the parables' lessons are a greater one, showing us that God's work is not only in the things you've heard of forever, the places it's prescribed to be. No, God's work is even in the mustard shrub, the mustard shrub that grows in your own backyard. See, what if it isn't about conventional salvation at all? But it's rather about theological intimacy, the slow growth of the kingdom and its interconnectedness. What if it's about stopping to realize the divine that's already around us? And as Jesus points out, we can't understand the end of the parable about the mustard shrub without first understanding the parable about the soil. The same soil where our faith story begins, in a garden. You'll remember that in Genesis, humans are created with breath blown through the dirt and then later ordained to toil over the earth. Which a better translation might be that we were called to serve and preserve the earth, to serve with the earth. The stuff of soil is literally where we begin and it's where our purpose is. Things growing from good soil is not just the stuff of Mark's story. It's the stuff of all the stories for our whole existence and for our whole relationship with God and God's creation. The Bible and our faith stories in it traverse soil, our struggles with soil, and land management through the kings, you'll remember, our gratitude for the soil. The Psalms talk about our fear of losing soil, and our modern wars are fought over the stuff. Our current unfolding ecological crisis is not that far off from our decline in Christianity. Checking in on the soil. Where is it? How's it doing? Those are spiritual questions. Those are questions of where is God? Where is the kingdom? So what if it's not allegory, but God is literally in the soil? See, if we take a moment to put parable and data together, it's no wonder that being with family and in nature is still providing a great source of meaning to people. What this parable may be telling us and what we are uniquely positioned to do as church is to give language, old language and new language, to help describe where God is, to help people describe their experiences of God. We can and we should be the place where people can share about the experiences they're having out there, out in the soil. And you'll notice by the anger that sometimes comes from many who have left the church, the anger is usually deep sadness. A sadness that the church is coming up short in offering a voice of legitimacy to God's presence all around. Giving voice to the prevalence and validity of spiritual experience is not a new struggle for the church, though. The mystics have shown us that, beginning with Jesus himself even, they long called out the church for trying to stifle spiritual experience and delegitimize it. In our stories today, the church has been the place trying to hide lamps under bushel baskets instead of paying attention to what we hear out there and taking steps to understand how the divine is at work, how the divine is still creating new things. But our parables also help us to focus and to not lose hope, that comfort the afflicted part. Diana Butler Bass takes up this topic in her latest book, Grounded, Finding God in the World, a Spiritual Revolution. In her first chapter, she shows us that our job might be what it's always been, 
to make good soil. Soil that is open and ready for the divine's presence. Soil that helps things to grow into what they are becoming. What God has called them to become, not what we think they should become. Because no matter how hard we try, a mustard shrub is not going to be a cedar tree. See, to her, we are soil keepers. And as soil keepers, we create foundations and opportunities with good earth. We trust that there are larger processes happening, that seeds can grow on their own if we just give them the nutrients they need and the space and time to do so. Maybe our parables today aren't calling our attention to a future far-off event of when and where this will be. But maybe they suggest that the kingdom is already here, present to those who take the time to listen and look. Perhaps the key to the mystery of the kingdom is in the literal act of seeking and listening and being present. Maybe God's already here in the mundane and obvious in our own backyard. As the statistics continue to show, no one needs the church's or anyone else's permission to experience the divine. But we do need a community to help process it. For it's in sharing experiences that they become meaningful and a part of memory. It's been posited that happiness is only real when shared. What if God is only real when shared? The light that the church has to offer, the lamp that shouldn't be hidden, is what we have offered for centuries. A language to help meaning out of experience. When the church serves to become the soil on which those experiences can be shared, where all are invited to share, then the mystery of the kingdom is upon us all. Just as Jesus told the purpose of parables to only a small group gathered, maybe the insiders he spoke to were really the outsiders, the ones worried about being gatekeepers to the divine. Maybe the parables warn us today to stay connected to the growing cycle, to soil quality and all the factors that impact creation. Because we are soil keepers, and from soil, recreation happens. So why church? Because recreation is loving with intention. Recreation is reconnecting to our soil vocation. It is reimagining a boundless garden space where the divine is encountered and helping to offer a language for shared experience. That's recreation. That's kingdom. The kingdom of our parables is as close as the dirt beneath our feet. The observations of creation doing what it was already created to do, as close as it ever was. Divine intimacy is in divine simplicity. When we get back to the soul, we realize, just as Elizabeth Johnson has said, that the most significant story in the history of religion at this time is not a decline in Western religion, a rejection of religious institutions, or the growth of religious extremism. Rather, it is a changed conception of God, a rebirthing of faith from the ground up. So why, church? Because at the end of the day, maybe recreation begins when we just experience the parables instead of trying to explain them. And maybe the place to start is where our parables do. Listen. And it's at, it's at this time that if you would like to join this community of faith, as we share our experiences of the divine, you're invited to come forward during the singing of our next hymn. Please stand if you're able. <clears throat>
You'll remember that piece of data where people find meaning in their lives. 69% of Americans find meaning in family. Well, there's some other data out that shows that the most meaningful practice families do together is share a meal. There's been data that's shown a correlation between kids who eat with their parents three to five times a week have less truancy, less substance abuse problems, and more reported overall happiness with life. So I think this is a place where the church gives language to where we experience the divine. Because we gather as a family each week. And actually our children and youth gather more than once a week together. We gather on Wednesdays too to eat a meal. So this is the place. This is an example of why church to gather and share this meal together. And to remember the ancient words that go along with our new words. For it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he gathered with his friends. He took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and blessed it and gave it to them saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Our Creator, let us connect and breathe as we connect with you at this table. Grant us stillness and quiet to come to this place to remember. To remember, no, to receive your gift of grace through Jesus Christ, who loves us even when we cannot. Here we take our communion to share our connection. Find your peace within. Let us receive this divine order and hope into our lives through the moment, the day, the week, and always. Remember here we share through bread and cup. We share in a gift eternal. Help us, Lord, to stay humble and here, allowing love and hope to grow in our faith. In your name we receive your remembrance forever. Amen.
As Tatum carries the light out this morning, reminding us that we follow the light out, out into the world, let us go from this place with ears to hear.